Hello and welcome to Le Algebras. In today's lecture, lecture number four, we will talk about the universal enveloping algebra. Let us start with some motivation. Consider a Lie algebra G. Then, as we have seen before, a representation of this Lie algebra is a Lie algebra homomorphism from G to the Lie algebra of all linear operators on some vector space V. We have to observe one thing. The image of this homomorphism phi is not closed under the composition of linear maps. The reason for that is the fact that phi is only a homomorphism of Lie algebras and not of associative algebras. So the image of phi is only closed under the commutator of linear maps, which is the Lie algebra operation in the Lie algebra GL of V. A special case of this observation is the so-called Casimir element, which we saw when we talked about finite dimensional representations of the Lie algebra SL2. This Casimir element is defined by the following expression, h plus 1 square plus 4 fe, where we see the composition of usual linear operators and not their commutators. So, in the general case, the Casimir element does not belong to the image of the Lie algebra homomorphism phi, which defines the corresponding representation of SL2. So we need to find some different object which would contain this Casimir element C. So our idea is to assign to our Lie algebra G some associative algebra, which is called the universal enveloping algebra of G, and usually denoted U of G. And this universal enveloping algebra should have the property that for each representation phi of G, we can extend this representation to a representation of U of G in such a way that this representation of U of G consists of all linear operators obtained by closing the image of phi with respect to the composition of linear operators. So let us first discuss the definition of the universal enveloping algebra. A universal enveloping algebra of G is a pair U and I, where U is an associative algebra and I is a Lie algebra homomorphism from G to the Lie algebra associated to the associative algebra U. Moreover, this pair should satisfy the following condition. For any associative algebra A and any Lie algebra homomorphism alpha from G to the Lie algebra associated with A, there should exist a unique homomorphism of associative algebras, which we denote by gamma, from U to A, such that the homomorphism alpha factors as gamma composed with I. Or, in other words, such that the following diagram commutes. So in this diagram, the homomorphism I is a homomorphism of Lie algebras from G to the Lie algebra associated to the associative algebra U. Alpha is a Lie algebra homomorphism from G to the Lie algebra associated to the associative algebra A. And gamma is a homomorphism of associative algebras from U to A. So if we take this definition, how can this be helpful in what we want to do? The point is that if phi is now some representation of G, which means a Lie algebra homomorphism from G to the Lie algebra GL of V, and the Lie algebra GL of V is the Lie algebra associated to the associative algebra A of all linear endomorphisms of V. So we can take as alpha our Lie algebra homomorphism phi and use this universal property of the universal enveloping algebras to obtain a homomorphism gamma of associative algebras from U to LVV, such that we have this factorization, such that phi equals to gamma composed with I. So in this way, the image of U under gamma will contain the image of phi under gamma and will be closed with respect to the composition of linear operators, simply because gamma is a homomorphism of associative algebras. As usual, if we have defined something using a universal property, there is no reason for such object to exist. So now we need to prove that a universal enveloping algebra always exists. 
However, as it is also usual for definitions given by a universal property, objects defined by universal property, if they exist, are usually unique up to isomorphism. Let's first prove that if a universal enveloping algebra exists, then it is unique up to isomorphism. And this is a usual uniqueness proof for objects which are defined using universal property. So we start with the following observation. Because of our universal property definition, if we consider the left diagram, so here we have the Lie algebra homomorphism I from G to the Lie algebra associated with the universal envelope algebra, which is given by the definition, and we consider as A and alpha the same U and the same I. So by the universal property, there should exist a unique homomorphism here, which makes this diagram commutative. Clearly, identity makes this diagram commutative. So because of the uniqueness, identity should be the only map which makes this diagram commutative. So now we go to the right-hand side of the diagram. Assume now that some Lie algebra G has two universal enveloping algebras. A universal enveloping algebra U1 with the Lie algebra homomorphism I1, which gives us this row of the diagram, and a universal enveloping algebra U2 with Lie algebra homomorphism I2 as indicated in this diagonal. So assume that G has two different universal enveloping algebras. Since U1 and I1 is a universal enveloping algebra, by the universal property, there should exist a homomorphism gamma 1 of associative algebras from U1 to U2, such that composition of I1 followed by gamma 1 is equal to I2. Similarly, since U2 is a universal enveloping algebra, there should exist a homomorphism gamma 2 of associative algebras from U2 to U1, such that I1 is equal to the composition of I2 followed by gamma 2. This gives us a homomorphism gamma 1 of associative algebras from U1 to U2 and a homomorphism gamma 2 of associative algebras from U2 to U1. The composition of gamma 1 and gamma 2 is a homomorphism of associative algebras from U1 to U1, which makes the left diagram commutative. So, since the left diagram is made commutative only by the identity morphism, because of the uniqueness requirement in the universal property, we conclude that the composition of gamma 1 and gamma 2 must be equal to the identity on U1. Similarly, the composition of gamma 2 followed by gamma 1 must be equal to the identity of U2, which means that gamma 1 and gamma 2 are mutually inverse isomorphisms. This proves our claim. So now we know that if a universal enveloping algebra exists, then it must be unique. Okay, let's now try to prove existence. So let's construct a universal enveloping algebra of G. To do this, we need to choose a basis of G. When we have a basis of the Lie algebra G, we can speak about the structure coefficients of the Lie bracket with respect to this basis. So given any pair of basis elements, we can consider the Lie bracket. This is a new element of our algebra G, so it can be written in a unique way as a linear combination of a basis elements, and we denote by Cijk the coefficients in this linear combination. So these elements from our field are called the structure coefficients of our Lie algebra with respect to our choice of basis. Now we are ready to define a universal enveloping algebra. So we define the universal enveloping algebra U of G as the quotient of the free associative algebra F generated by generators AI indexed by the same set which indexes the basis of our algebra G. So we take the quotient of this free associative algebra by the ideal I generated by the following elements. So for each pair AI and AJ of generators, we take the commutator AI AJ minus AJ AI and then subtract the linear combination of AKs with the structure coefficients which come from the structure coefficients of our Lie algebra. In other words, the generators of the ideal, which is used to define the universal enveloping algebra, are taken from 
this expression for structure coefficients, where we additionally interpret the Lie bracket in the Lie algebra as the commutator in our associative algebra. An easy example, if the algebra G is abelian, which means that the commutator of any pair of elements is, is equal to zero, then in this expression, the right-hand side disappears. This is equal to zero. So in this expression, the third summon disappears. It's equal to zero, which means that the corresponding universal enveloping algebra becomes just the polynomial algebra with generators AI, because the generators of the ideal become AI AJ minus AJ AI. So this prescribes that the generators of the universal enveloping algebra commute. It is now a good time to prove that the associative algebra U, which we have just defined, is a universal enveloping algebra for G. First of all, we define a linear map I from G to U in the following way. We send a basis element GI of G to the generator AI of U. This extends uniquely to a linear map from our Lie algebra G to U, simply because GI, where I runs through I, is a basis of our Lie algebra. The claim is that the pair consisting of U and this linear map I is a universal enveloping algebra of G. There are two things to prove here. First of all, we need to check that I is a homomorphism of Lie algebras from G to the Lie algebra associated to the associative algebra U. And the second thing to prove here is the universal property of the universal enveloping algebra. So let's start with checking that I from G to the Lie algebra associated to U is a Lie algebra homomorphism. So we need to check that I of a bracket is equal to the bracket of the I's. We check this on basis elements. So let's consider I of the bracket of GI and GJ. So we have already seen that in the Lie algebra G, the bracket of GI and GJ is given as the linear combination of GKs with our structure coefficient Cijk. So here we just use the definition of the Lie bracket in the algebra G. Now we use that I is a linear map, so we can move out the sum and the coefficients from the expression of I. So we have the sum over K in I, our coefficient Cijk, and then I of GK. But I of GK is AK. This is by definition. So here is our definition. So we can rewrite this as a sum over K in I, CIJK, AK. Now we can use uh, the definition of the universal enveloping algebra, where we have the ideal, which was generated by certain elements, which allows us to rewrite this sum as a commutator of AI AJ minus AJ AI. So now we use again the definition of the map I, which sends GI to AI. So we can rewrite this commutator as a commutator of the elements I of GI and I of GJ. And finally, we use that the commutator is exactly the Lie bracket on the Lie algebra associated to an associative algebra. And finally, we get the equality which we needed. So I maps the Lie bracket of GI and GJ to the Lie bracket of I of GI and I of GJ. So indeed, I is a homomorphism of Lie algebras. Now we need to check the universal property. Let A be any associative algebra and alpha be a Lie algebra homomorphism from G to the Lie algebra associated with A. By the universal property of the free algebra F, we have a unique homomorphism of associative algebras from F to A, which sends the generator AI of F to the element alpha of GI, where I is in our indexing set. Let us note that the homomorphism beta maps the generator of our ideal I, which was used to define the universal enveloping algebra, to zero. Indeed, beta is a homomorphism of associative algebras, so we can use this to rewrite this in the form, so beta of A of I is by definition alpha of GI, so we have alpha of GI, alpha of GJ, minus alpha of GJ, alpha of GI, 
minus a linear combination of alphas of g of k. And now we can use the fact that alpha is a homomorphism of Lie algebras, so it maps the Lie bracket in G into the commutator in A, and so this expression becomes alpha of the Lie bracket in G minus this linear combination, which is zero, because Cijks are structure coefficients in the Lie algebra G. So beta sends generators of the ideal, which was used to define the universal enveloping algebra, to zero. Therefore, it factors through the quotient of f by this ideal, which is exactly u. And we can consider the induced map given by this factorization, which we denote by gamma. So this is a map from u to a. And by construction, we have the equality that gamma post-composition with i is exactly alpha. So this shows existence of such map gamma. Uniqueness of gamma follows directly from the fact that the algebra U is generated by the elements AI, which were used to define the homomorphism beta. Okay, so this completes the proof of the justification. So we know that the associative algebra U is a universal enveloping algebra of G. So universal enveloping algebras exist, and they are unique up to isomorphism. But the good question is, how big is a universal enveloping algebra? In order to answer this question, we need to introduce some more notions. First of all, we need to assume that our set i, which indexes a chosen basis in G, is well ordered. So if G is finite dimensional, then i is finite, and we choose some linear order on this set. If G is infinite dimensional, we have to choose some well ordering on the set i. Definition, a monomial AI1, AI2, and so on, AIM, is called standard, provided that the indices for the generating elements in this monomial are ordered with respect to our well ordering, which is fixed on our indexing set i. poincare birgoff witt theorem answers the question how big the algebra U is. The statement of the theorem is that standard monomials form a basis of the universal enveloping algebra. And here basis means a basis as a vector space over our field K. One nice consequence of this, that our morphism I from the original Lie algebra G to the universal enveloping algebra U is injective because I maps basis elements gi to the corresponding generators ai and of course each generator is a monomial and is a standard monomial and the poincare birkhoff witt theorem claims that standard monomials are linearly independent therefore i must be injected so this is a nice corollary from the poincare birkhoff witt theorem there are two things we need to prove we need to prove the standard monomials form a basis of U, which means that we need to prove that they generate U and that they are linearly independent. The easy part is to prove that standard monomials generate U. So how does one prove that standard monomials generate U? So we need to find a way to write any monomial as a linear combination of standard monomials. Clearly, all monomials generate U by definition. So if we can write any monomial as a linear combination of standard monomials, this would imply that standard monomials generate U. So how can we take a monomial which is not standard and write it as a linear combination of standard monomials? In order to do that, we can use commutation relations in our Lie algebra. So this works as follows. Assume that we have a monomial U AI, AJ, V, where U and V are some monomials, and AI, AJ appear in this monomial in the wrong order. I is greater than J. So this, this is an inversion in the monomial which prevents it from being close to standard monomial. Then we can use a commutation relation in the universal enveloping algebra, which says that the product of AI, AJ can be rewritten as AJ, AI, plus the commutator of AI and AJ. Because of the relations in the universal enveloping algebra, the commutator of AI and AJ can be written as a linear combination of AKs with some coefficients. So this element will be a linear combination of monomials of strictly smaller degree. So therefore, 
Using this relation, we can write our original monomial U A I A J V as the sum of U A G A I V and the element U times the commutator of A I A G and V. So here the monomial U A G A I V is closer to a standard monomial because J is smaller than I. So now the elements J and I here appear in the correct order while the element u commutator a i a j v is a linear combination of monomials of strictly smaller degrees. Therefore, we can complete the proof of the generation property for standard monomials using the double induction, one on the degree of the monomial and another one on the number of inversions, that is the number of pairs i j in a monomial which appear in the monomial in the wrong order. So this was the easy part, the generation part, that standard monomials generate U. A more difficult task is to prove that standard monomials are linearly independent. And what is the idea? How does one prove that something is linearly independent for an algebra which is defined by generators and relations? The main idea is to try to prove linear independence in some representation of this algebra. And for algebras which are constructed by generators and relations, it is usually easy to construct representations. You need only to define what generators do and check the relations. And this is what we are going to do now. So let's construct a representation of U. Denote by B the polynomial algebra in variables BI, which is again indexed by our index set I. And note that this is a polynomial algebra, so this BI's commute. Therefore, the algebra B has the standard basis, which consists exactly of standard monomials in BIs, in our variables BI. So now we define the action of our universal enveloping algebra on standard monomials in B in the following recursive way. So we take a generator AI from our universal enveloping algebra, and we want to apply it to a standard monomial B, J1, J2, and so on, B, J, M. So there are two cases. The first case assumes that I is greater than or equal to the maximal index J, M, which appears in our standard monomial. Then we just multiply our standard monomial with B, I. So I is greater than or equal to J, M. So this monomial which we obtain is again a standard monomial. So this is the easy case. A difficult case is when i is strictly smaller than jm. In this case, we proceed inductively. We use the first case first to write this monomial as slightly smaller monomial until bjm minus 1, and then the bigger monomial can be obtained by applying ajm to the smaller monomial. And then we use a commutator relation in our Lie algebra. So we swap ajm and ai and write this expression, and then the price to pay is the commutator of them applied to this shorter monomial. This is well defined because we again have double induction. So here AI is defined on a smaller monomial, so this is one induction, and AJM will be defined on a bigger monomial, of, on monomial of length M, but JM is bigger than I, so this will be closer to define into the first step. And in the second case, we define the action of the commutator on a shorter monomial, so this is again induction by the length of the monomial. So our claim, this definition, defines an action of the associative algebra U on the vector space B. If we can prove that this defines an action of U on B, then this would imply that standard monomials must be linearly independent. Indeed, standard monomials in U, when applied to the identity element in B, give exactly the standard basis of B. But the elements in the standard basis are linearly independent. Therefore, the standard monomials in U must be linearly independent as well. It is left to prove that this definition gives us an action of the algebra U on B. What do we really need to check? We really need to check that the elements of the ideal I, which was used to define the associative algebra U, act on B as zero. The inductive definition here clearly defines an action of the free algebra F on B. So in order to prove that this induces an action of U, 
we really need to prove that the element of the ideal i, which was used to define u, act on b as 0. In order to check that elements of i act on b as 0, we have to consider six different cases. The generic element of i is like that, and we need to prove that its action on b is 0, and we will have six different cases depending on the ordering of the elements i, j, and i m. The element i m is from the formula defining the action. So one needs to consider six cases. We consider two of them, the easiest one and the most complicated one. So the easiest case is the case when i is the greatest out of these three elements, and then g is smaller than i, and jm is the smallest out of these three elements. Under this assumption, the first summand in our expression applied to the monomial bj1 and so on bjm, by definition gives us a monomial when we just add bj and bi at the end. So for the second summand, we already need to use the second case in the definition of how our algebra acts on the monomial, so ai acts directly by adding bi, but aj, now j is smaller than i, so we have to rewrite it. This summand we know from before, and we will have additionally this summand, but then in this linear combination, the first two summands, we have the minus sign, so this and this cancel, and the price which we have paid is this summand, which can be rewritten like that using the bracket relation of AI and AJ, and this will cancel with a third summand here. So combining the three definitions, we will get that in this case, this element from our ideal acts as zero. So this is the easy case. Let us look at the last case, the most difficult one. This is a case when our indices i, j, and j, m are ordered in the following way. i is the minimal index and j, m is the maximal index with j in between. For simplicity, we denote by u the monomial b, j, 1, b, j, 2, and so on up to b, j, m minus 1. Using this notation, we can now compute what happens when we apply the summons of our expression of an element in i to the monomial u, b, j, m. For the first summand, a, i, a, j, when we apply it to u, b, j, m, we have to use the second case in the definition of the action. This is because j is smaller than j, m. So we keep a, i, and we write the formula for the second case of the action. Now we have to apply a, i to this formula. So to the second summand, we apply it directly, and in the first summand, i is again smaller than j, m, so we need to use the second case in the definition of the action. This results in the following expression for the action of a, i, a, j on the monomial u, b, j, m. Similarly, we can compute the action of a, j, a, i on this monomial. Again, we first apply a, i and use the second case in the formula of the definition of the action, and then we apply a, j directly to the second summand and to the first summand using the formula in the definition of the action, and we get a similar expression. And the action of the third summand can be written in this way. So now let us take a look at the result. So we need to take the first expression and subtract the second one and the third one. So in these three expressions, we have the orange terms, where we have a i a j minus a j a i minus the commutator applied to a shorter monomial. So since we apply it to a shorter monomial, by induction, we can assume that the orange summons cancel. So now we have the two magenta summons. They are similar up to commutator. So we can cancel them, but we should remember that this leaves us with the commutator. Similarly, the sign summons also cancel on the expense that we obtain the commutator with the correct sign coming from the second term. So we are now left with two commutators, one from the magenta summons, one from the sign summons, and we also have this black term coming from the third expression. If we add them up, we will get exactly the Jacobi identity for our elements. And so we can conclude that this is zero because of the Jacobi identity. So this completes our most complicated case 
for checking that our formula give a well-defined action of the universal enveloping algebra on our polynomial algebra B. We have done the easiest case and the most complicated case and the four remaining cases can be done in a similar way. So this completes the proof of the poincare birkhoff witt theorem. Let us discuss one consequence of the construction of the universal enveloping algebra. Assume that we have a Lie algebra G and let U be its universal enveloping algebra. First, we observe that every U module is also a G module via our inclusion map I. So we can just restrict the module structure from U to G. Because of the universal property of the universal enveloping algebra, each G module extends uniquely to a U module. Furthermore, homomorphisms between G modules are exactly the same as homomorphisms between U modules. So this implies that there is an isomorphism between the categories of all U modules and all G modules. Each object of the first category can be viewed as an object of the second category, and each object of the second category is uniquely an object of the first category, and U and G homomorphisms between different objects are the same linear maps. So we have an isomorphism between the category of all U modules and the category of all G modules. And this isomorphism restricts to an isomorphism between the categories of all finitely generated U modules and all finitely generated G modules. There is, however, a price to pay for this. Even in the case when the original algebra G was finite dimensional and non-zero, the associative algebra U will always be infinite dimensional. So in some sense, finite dimensional Lie algebras is a fancy way to encode into a finite dimensional object information about some infinite dimensional associative object. Thank you very much. Hope you have enjoyed the lecture.